Chapter 1 of Police Your Planet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Police Your Planet by Lester Del Rey Chapter 1 One-Way Ticket there were ten passengers in the little pressurized cabin of the electric bus that shuttled between the rocket field and Marshport. Ten men, the driver, and Bruce Gordon. He sat apart from the others, as he had kept to himself on the ten-day trip between Earth and Mars, with the yellow stub of his ticket still stuck defiantly in the band of his hat, proclaiming that Earth had paid his passage without his permission being asked. His big, lean body was slumped slightly in the seat. There was no expression on his face. He listened to the driver explaining to a couple of firsters that they were actually on what appeared to be one of the mysterious canals when viewed from Earth. Every book on Mars gave the fact that the canals were either an illusion or something which could not be detected on the surface of the planet. He glanced back toward the rocket that still pointed skyward back on the field, and then forward toward the city of Marsport, sprawling out in a mess of slums beyond the edge of the dome that had been built to hold air over the central part, and at last he stirred and reached for the yellow stub. He grimaced at the one way stamped on it, then tore it into bits and let the pieces scatter over the floor. He counted them as they fell. Thirty pieces one for each year of his life, little ones for the two years he'd wasted as a cop, shreds for the four years as a kid in the ring before that, he'd never made the top, bigger bits for two years also wasted in trying his hand at professional gambling, and the six final pieces that spelled his rise from a special reporter, helping out with a police shake-up coverage, through a regular leg man turning up rackets, and up on like a meteor until. He'd made his big scoop all right. He'd dug up enough about the mercury scandals to double circulation. And the government had explained what a fool he'd been for printing half of a story that was never supposed to be printed until all could be revealed. They'd given Bruce Gordon his final assignment. He shrugged. He'd bought a suit of airtight coveralls and a helmet at the field. He had some cash and a set of reader cards in his pocket. The supply house Earthside had assured him that this pattern had never been exported to Mars. With them and the knife he'd selected, he might get by. The Solar Security Office had given him the knife practice to make sure he could use it, just as they'd made sure he hadn't taken any extra money with him beyond the regulation amount. You're a traitor and we'd like nothing better than seeing your gut spilled, the security man had told him. That paper you swiped was marked top secret, but we don't get many men with your background. Cop, tin horn, fighter, who have brains enough for our work, so you're bound for Mars rather than the Mercury Mines if. It was a big if, and a vague one. They needed men on Mars who could act as links in their information bureau and be ready to work on their side when the expected trouble came. They wanted men who could serve them loyally, even without orders. If he did them enough service, they might let him back to Earth. If he caused trouble enough, they could still ship him to Mercury. And suppose nothing happens, he asked. Then who cares? You're just lucky enough to be alive. And what makes you think I'm going to be a spy for security? The other had shrugged. Why not, Gordon? You've been a spy for a yellow scandal sheet. Why not for us? Gordon had been smart enough to realize that perhaps security was right. They were in the slums around the city now. Marsport had been settled faster than it was ready to receive. Temporary buildings had been thrown up, and then had remained, decaying into death traps. 
It wasn't a pretty view that visitors got as they first reached Mars. But nobody except the romantic fools had ever thought frontiers were pretty. The drummer who had watched Gordon tear up his yellow stub moved forward now. First time, he asked. Gordon nodded, mentally cataloging the drummer as the cockroach type. Midway between the small businessman slug and the petty crook spider types that weren't worth bothering with. But the other took it as interest. Been here dozens of times myself. Risking your life just to go into Marsport? Why Congress doesn't clean it up, I'll never know. Gordon's mind switched to the readers in his bag. The cards were plastic and should be good enough for a week or so of use before they showed wear. During that time, by playing it carefully, he should have his stake. Then if the gambling tables here were as crudely run as an old-timer he'd known on Earth had said, he could try a coup. Be at my mother Cory soon, the fat little drummer babbled on. Notorious. Worst place on Mars. Take it from me, brother. That's something. Even the cops are afraid to go in there. See it? There, to your left. The name was vaguely familiar as one of the sore spots of Marsport. Bruce Gordon looked and spotted the ragged building a half mile outside the dome. It had been a rocket maintenance hangar once, then had been turned into temporary dwelling for the first deportees when Earth began flooding Mars. Now seeming to stand by habit alone, it radiated desolation and decay. He stood up, grabbed for his bag, and spinning the drummer aside, he jerked forward and caught the driver's shoulder, getting off. The driver shrugged his hand away. Don't be crazy, mister. They... He turned, saw it was Gordon, and his face turned blank. It's your life, buster, he said, and reached for the brake. I'll give you five minutes to get into coveralls and helmet and out through the airlock. Gordon needed less than that. He'd practice all the way from Earth. The transparent plastic of the coveralls went on easily enough and his hands found the seals quickly. He slipped his few possessions into a bag at his belt, slid the knife into a spring holster above his wrist, and picked up the bull-shaped helmet. It seated on a plastic seal, and the little air compressor at his back began to hum, ready to turn the thin wisp of Mars atmosphere into a barely breathable pressure. He tested the Mars speaker, an amplifier and speaker in another pouch, designed to raise the volume of his voice to a level where it could carry through even the air of Mars. Gordon moved down unpaved streets that zigzagged along, thick with the filth of garbage and poverty, the part of Mars never seen in the newsreels, outside the shock movies. Thin kids with big eyes and sullen mouths crowded the streets in their air suits, yelling profanity. The street was filled with people watching with a numbed hunger for any kind of excitement. It was late afternoon, obviously. Men were coming from the few bus routes, lugging tools and lunch baskets. Slumped and beaten from labor in the atomic plants, the Martian conversion farms, and the industries that had come inevitably where inefficiency was better than the high prices of imports. The saloons were doing well enough, apparently from the number that streamed in through the airlock entrances. But Gordon saw one of the bartenders paying money to a thick-set person with an arrogant sneer. He knew then that the few profits from the cheap beer were never going home with the man. Storekeepers in the cheap little shops had the same lines on their faces as they saw on those of their customers. Poverty and misery were the keynotes here, rather than the evil half-world the drummer had babbled about. But to Gordon's trained eyes, there was plenty of outright rottenness, too. He grimaced grateful that the supercharger on his air suit filtered out some of the smell which the thin air carried. 
He thought he was familiar with human misery from his own earth, slum background. But there was no attempt to disguise it here. Ahead, Mother Cory's reared up, a huge ugly half-cylinder of pitted metal and native bricks, showing the patchwork of decades before repairs had been abandoned. There were no windows, though once there had been, and the front was covered up with a big sign that spelled out Condemned. The air seal was filthy, and there was no bell. Gordon kicked against the side, waited, and kicked again. A slit opened and closed. He waited, then drew his knife and began prying at the worn cement around the air seal, looking for the lock that had been there. The seal suddenly quivered, indicating that metal inside had been withdrawn. Gordon grinned tautly, stepped through, and pushed the blade against the inner plastic. All right, all right, a voice whined out of the darkness. You don't have to puncture my seal, you're in. Then call them off. A wheezing chuckle answered him, and a phosphor bulb glowed weakly, shedding some light on a filthy hall. Okay, boys, the voice said. Come on down. He's alone, anyhow. What's pushing, stranger? A yell ticket, Gordon told him, and a government allotment that'll last me two weeks in the dome. I figure on making it last six here, and don't let my being a firster give you hot palms. My brother was Lanny Gordon. It happened to be true, though Bruce Gordon hadn't seen his brother from the time the man had left the family as a young punk to the day they finally convicted him on his twenty-first murder. But here, if it was like places he'd known on earth, even second-hand contact with muscle was useful. It seemed to work. A huge man oozed out of the shadows, his gray face contorting its doughy fat into a yellow-toothed grin, and a filthy hand waved back the others. There were a few wisps, of long gray hair on the head and face, and they quivered as he moved forward. Looking for a room, he whined. I'm looking for Mother Cory. Then you're looking at him, Cobber. Sleep on the floor? Want a bunk? Squat with four? Or room and duchess to yourself? There was a period of haggling, followed by a wait as Mother Cory kicked four grumbling men out of a four-by-seven hole on the second floor. Gordon's money had carried more weight than his brother's reputation for that. Cory humored his guest's wish for privacy. All yours, Cobber, why your crackles blew. It was a filthy, dark place, and one corner was an unsheeted bed. There was a rusty bucket for water, a hole kicked through the floor for waste water. Plumbing in such luxuries apparently hadn't existed for years, except for the small cistern and worn water recovery plant in the basement, beside the tired-looking weeds in the hydroponic tanks that tried unsuccessfully to keep the air breathable. What about a lock on the door, Gordon asked. What good would it do you? Got a different way here, we have. One credit a week and you get Mother Cory's word nobody busts in, and it sticks, Cobber, one way or the other. Gordon paid and tossed his pouch on the filthy bed. With a little work, the place could be cleaned enough. He pulled the cards out of his pouch, trying to be casual. Mother Cory stood staring at the pack while Bruce Gordon changed out of his air suit, gagging faintly as the full effluvium of the place hit him. Where does a man eat around here? Mother Cory pried his eyes off the cards and ran a thick tongue over heavy lips. Uh, oh, eat. There's a place about ten blocks back. Cobber, stop teasing me. 
with elections coming up and the boys loaded with vote money back in town. With a deck of cheaters like that, you want to eat? He picked the deck up fondly, while a faraway look came into his clouded eyes. Same ones. Same identical ones I wore out not twenty years ago. Smuggled two decks up here. Set to clean up, and I did for a while. He shook his head sadly and handed the deck back to Gordon. Come on down. For the sight of these, I'll give you the lay for your pitch. And when your luck's made or broken, remember Mother Corey was your friend first. And your old mother can get longer use from them than you can. He waddled off, telling of his plans to take Mars for a cleaning, once long ago. Gordon followed him, staring at the surrounding filth. His thoughts were churning so busily that he didn't see the blonde girl until she had forced her way past them on the stairs. Then he turned back, but she had vanished into one of the rooms. End of chapter 1